हाँ इनको इनको भी स्वाप करने से हो गया आप लोग का अच्छा तो ये फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन का क्या आंसर है हीडोनिज्म और परस्यूट ऑफ प्लेजर हाँ कर रहे हैं बस अब फर्स्ट थ्री का तो हो गया होगा तो प्रिवलेज मुहैया की जाते हैं वो देख लेंगे बाद में अच्छा तो क्या ख्याल है इसके बारे में ट्रू है सही है वाई वाई डी एक बात ये है कि ये कहीं लिखा भी तो नहीं हुआ है किसी टेक्स्ट बुक में परसूट ऑफ प्लेजर इज दी पर्पज ऑफ लाइफ तो वट दे से यानी यू हैव टू अंडरस्टैंड दिस कि वो कहते हैं कि भाई हम तो कोई नॉर्मेटिव स्टेटमेंट तो कर ही नहीं रहे हम वी आर डिस्क्राइबिंग द बिहेवियर ऑफ ह्यूमन बींग्स वी आर एन इकोनॉमिक थ्योरी इज एन ऑब्जेक्टिव थ्योरी इट इज नॉट इट इज ए पॉजिटिव थ्योरी पॉजिटिव मीन्स कि इट डिस्क्राइब्स वॉट द रियालिटी इट डजेंट मेक प्रिस्क्रिप्शन अबाउट वॉट ऑट टू बी मगर ये कहते हैं कि एवरी ह्यूमन बींग मैक्सिमाइज कंसम्पन तो अब ये दिस इज अ डिसेप्शन दिस इज नॉट ट्रू दिस इज नॉट ट्रू इवन ऑफ यानी वेरी ग्रीडी एंड सेल्फिश ह्यूमन बींग्स बिकॉज वाई इज इट नॉट ट्रू ऑफ यानी इवन इफ समबडी इज एन एथिस्ट एंड समबडी इज प्योरली लव्स टू ड्रिंक वाइन एंड हैव प्लेजर इवन दीज पीपल आर नॉट बिहेविंग लाइक economists believe why not a uh, certain amount of altruism is built in also actually human being get pleasure from the admiration and appreciation of other people and if they are completely cruel and cold and selfish then they are not liked by others not even their own families yani um you can see this very clearly i mean there are people who are extremely selfish they don't bring benefit to anybody so when their janaza takes place and you <laughs> participate in this you will see that their family members are talking about what he left and whether uh, who who will get to get uh, the house and who gets the car they are not talking concerned about how he died nobody is crying at this funeral so there is uh, some people who are very selfish but they care for their own family so when you get to their janaza you find that their family is crying but all the neighbors are just chatting among themselves about so then there are people who are more uh, generous and they are helping their neighbors so then you find that the all the neighborhood is is uh, feeling sad and you can see this and when you go to the janaza it's, it's obvious so basically uh, every human being wants to be loved and uh, this is what makes him happy so modern society says don't love anybody else only care for your own self and this makes it impossible for you to find happiness because if the whole society consists of selfish people then you don't love anybody else and nobody else loves you and nobody will be happy and this is the this is what the modern life is teaching us yani in many movies that are coming out and the same message that um, is being given that pursue pleasure regardless of yani if a person if a man is married and he has family and he has children but he sees a young girl that he likes he should leave his family and pursue his his uh, love and this is supposed and this is praised as being 
the the right thing to do that this man is 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 a great individual and he has and uh, and in many movies show that and you seize the moment you have you have only one chance to live so uh don't forget forget about uh, others forget about your wife and children and forget about any social responsibility forget about your old parents and serving them that's going to just destroy your life so this is the message which is being very strongly and clearly and explicitly given that pursue pleasures forget about everybody else this is uh, uh theory so this is this is uh, but it is a deception this is not this is neither objectively true that human beings are not like that and nor is it normatively true that if you behave like that you will find happiness it's it's a deception on both both fronts so the second question uh, maximizing consumption will maximize our happiness and welfare in log ka bhi swap kar do aur ha sahi so this is true modern economic theory asserts that is this true no this is what this confuses short term pleasure with long term pleasure this, and this is the source i mean this is not that it's totally true at any time even if your stomach is full if you if a delicious cake is brought in front of you and you eat it it will bring you pleasure but later on it will give you a stomach ache <laughs> because you are, you are full so you shouldn't eat but it is pleasurable it is desirable and for the moment your tongue will taste the sweetness so this idea that the short term pleasure is the same as long term pleasure this is wrong and the idea that you know in the short term i can be happy by eating cake means that i found the recipe for be- becoming happy in my lifetime this is completely wrong maximizing consumption over your lifetime is not going to bring you maximum happiness but this is what economic theory teaches the third thing is that the value of human time and effort can be measured in terms of how much it contributes to the production of wealth yeah this is also true this marginal product of labor and human resource and human capital and how do we train people so that they can become more productive all of this is <coughs> yani actually cheapening of human life this uh, doesn't understand what human beings are and how valuable they are and this is in opposition to the quran which says that uh, if you take one life it is as if you have destroyed the entire mankind so every human being is infinitely precious you cannot buy one human life with all the gold in the world if you kill one human being you cannot give him life even if you spend the whole resources of the mankind and you cannot produce another person like him even if you have infinite resources so human lives are infinitely precious but economics doesn't recognize that it only recognizes how what can you do to earn money and we are also deceived all the students here they are also thinking that my value uh once i earn a degree then i go in the market and if i can get a job for 150000 then that's that's my value and the person who can only make 50000 he is less good than the person who can make 150000 and this is a, and my value people students are taught to believe that we are cheap we are for sale and if i can sell my life for a high price then this is good for me so the idea that islam gave us that no all the gold in the world cannot buy your life we don't understand it we don't believe it we don't understand that all human beings are infinitely precious so <clears throat> the second thing um is it true that uh, human beings are always generous and never behave selfishly this is false yes human beings are actually so what is the truth here based on observations and experience about human being our human being this is actually the name of a chapter in colin camerer's you see economic theory assumes that human beings are selfish but when you look at behavior you find that this is not true so there is a chapter in uh, the handbook of behavioral economics are human beings selfish or are they generous so what's the answer to this question what Yes, it is. Most of the attributes that we manifest is uh, 
Yes. Both tendencies are simultaneously present in the human heart. This is something which uh, people have very great difficulty understanding because uh, we are trained in binary logic. Something is either true or false. So Islam is beyond binary lo logic. Allah, uh, Iqbal says that مقام عقل سے آسان گزر گیا اقبال مقام عشق میں مارا گیا یہ فرزانہ so the thing is that this binary logic says something is either true or it is false either man is selfish or he is generous he cannot be both but actually the truth is that the human being is both and at the same time and so uh, the human heart is a battleground between good and evil Allah Ta'ala says, Hadainahun Najdain. I have shown him both the highways of the good and the evil. And I have let him free to choose. So at one moment you can choose good and at the second moment you can choose the bad. And you can have, and this is explicit in a hadith, that a man who has been good all his life, but suddenly he makes the opposite choice. <coughs> or a man who committed hundred murders and then he decided to make tawbah. <coughs> so if you run a regression on his life then you will not find that there is any possibility for the straight line to turn suddenly into a curve but uh, this is the human beings are free they are not bound by their past they are not machines they are not robots So what about question number five? All of the players offer a fair 50-50 split. True. False. This is false. false. <laughs> 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 no, actually the, yani, we have the data about um, most players offer 40%, uh, 50%, 60%, but uh, mm, not all. No, nearly all means 90%. <laughs> and uh, this is uh, uh, the reality is 50% or even less. So this is false. Long term happiness is maximized by possession of wealth. False. This is false. All right. So following changes occurred in Europe due to the great transformation. Social, what was the great transformation? Yes, the market took over the society. What uh, in the technical terminology used by um, Polanyi, is Polanyi says that markets were subordinate to the society and there's the social networks and markets are used as, as, a, as, as one way to exchange, which is but uh, then, um, so if somebody is needs an education, it is not that he must go through the market. Market can be used, but uh, generally speaking, the, it is the social responsibility of all members of the society to take care of those who need. So if the market doesn't work, then we will find some other way to provide him with the food. So if anyone is hungry, then if he can buy the goods from the market, fine. If he cannot, that doesn't mean that now we have no responsibility, which is what the market society teaches. Actually, if somebody is hungry and he doesn't have money, then we must pr find some other way to feed him. So this is when the social responsibility dominates. When the market dominates, uh, he says that uh, the social re relationships became embedded within the market society. The market is now dominant. Social uh, relations is a subordinate. So actually it was taught that, look, you cannot provide for the poor. Because if you take care of the poor, then who will uh, do the labor? So, um, social relations and family ties become less important. Today, because this uh, process is continuing, it's not that it stopped, it's not that it has slowed down. So over the 30 years that, over the past uh, many 60 years that I have been living, uh, the amount of uh, 
wealth being produced is more and more and how it is being produced because more and more people are uh, working previously only the man had to work and he was feeding the whole family now the both the husband and the wife must work and that's necessary to feed the family so uh, this is because exploitation is increasing wealth more wealth is being produced but more of it is going to the rich so the poor people have to work even harder to keep in the same place so so sh- and, and that's causing breakdown of family because the neither the husband nor the wife has time to look after the children so um family ties and social relation become less important greed and ac- accumulation of wealth became socially acceptable is this this is true people started to value human lives more oh, this is false economic theory explains why income inequality increases and how income redistribution is required to produce fair and equitable outcomes false economic theory does not do that although some economists like piketty and stiglitz and others have have done this but this is not part of economic theory economic theory deceives the poor into believing that policies which are good for the wealthy are also good for them true. this is true economic theory argues that we should provide for each person according to how much they need false the islamic solution to economic problems is based on the following principles we must concentrate us on producing wealth as this is essential to solving the problem of poverty false human lives are infinitely precious so human beings should not be used for labor instead instead they should spend their time in worship and pursuit of higher goals of akhirah false false false, false. we should force wealthy people to give their excess wealth to the needy true false false, false. false. <laughs> no we have to uh, forcing this is the marxist solution yes. the islamic solution is to persuade the wealthy people to tell them that wealth is not um is not the solution to their problems and if they give wealth they will, it will make it hap- make them happier but sir in ancient time jihad were produced against those who were not making jihad so yes in the this is the exceptional yani this is also permissible but this is not the solution all right so let's go through the lecture all right let's go collect kar lo मार्क्स लगा देगी कोई बात नहीं सो यू सी वन थिंग दैट यू हैव टू अंडरस्टैंड इज दैट इफ वी वॉन्ट टू स्टडी सोशल साइंस वी मस्ट start by thinking about what is the purpose of our life and now i am not asking this question as a muslim in the sense that you must uh, make the purpose of uh, of our life uh, the uh, success of the day of judgment which is what i would have to answer as a muslim i am saying that as a scientist as a study of human <coughs> beings before i start studying human being i ask what what is your purpose because if i want to understand human behavior i have to know what is your purpose because human beings you know varian starts by saying that human beings are trying to maximize their uh, human behavior is goal directed every person has some purpose yani whether or not he can articulate it whether or not he can express it clearly all actions are meaningful purposeful they are trying to do something it is certainly possible it happens that people don't know what their own purpose is 
but their actions reveal this purpose because any action you do is in attempt to get uh, to a goal so if you want to understand human behavior you have to understand what is the goal of that person and now that goal is not maximization of consumption usually human beings are not that simple they are not robots and uh, yes in some cases uh, uh, people are doing that because they have been fooled into believing that this is what will bring them happiness so uh, one thing to understand from this is that we have the opportunity because social science is completely based on wrong premises we have the opportunity to create a revolution in knowledge and actually this is exactly what happened uh, in the early period of Islam how did the Muslims conquer the world they were not stronger human beings and they did not have better weapons <laughs> and the Prophet ﷺ never taught them the techniques of warfare there is no chapter about chemical weapons or bombs in the uh, in the Bukhari what he did teach them was how to become uh, human beings and he taught them the thirst for knowledge the message of the Quran starts by saying Allah Ta'ala Allam al insana ma'alam ya is the being who teaches the people what they do not know so the knowledge that was given to the Muslims and the thirst for knowledge that seek knowledge even if it is in China that uh, the ink of the scholar is more valuable than the blood of the martyr and that the person who goes out in the search of knowledge he is like the person who is going for Hajj and the person who is going for Jihad and the angels spread their wings in his path and Allah Ta'ala makes easy for him the path to paradise so these are any very powerful and there are whole books of the of virtues of seeking knowledge and so the Muslims sought knowledge and this is what led them to the leader of the ship of the world and this is true both on an individual level that knowledge can change your life knowledge can teach you how to become a better person and uh, how to improve your life both in this world and in the Akhira and also how to improve the lives of other people unfortunately both the meaning of knowledge became corrupt in the West because after the <coughs> great transformation knowledge was redefined as knowledge is valuable only if it allows you to earn money so if I am teaching something the student asks is this going to come on the exam <laughs> otherwise it's of no value if it's on the exam then it will bring me the score that will give me the grade that will give me the degree that will give me the job and that will bring me that is valuable if it is knowledge which is not going to be on the exam then it's useless so this idea of knowledge as a means to earn money this is completely yani, it's poisonous it destroys the meaning of knowledge and it destroys the idea of the search for knowledge it destroys the idea that angels will not spread your, their wings uh, under the person who is seeking knowledge in order to make money so today just as 1400 years ago Islam gives us real knowledge and all of this apparent knowledge of the West is just garbage it is you know, by uh, getting a PhD you can learn how to make money but you cannot learn how to become a better person so uh, so now we have uh, uh, when we consider uh, try to understand purpose then we have the um, the scientific method is about study you see you take this wall and you study it is this uh, made of wood 
what are the properties of the wood, uh, how much uh, force will it take to break it and things like that. So these are properties which are inherent in the wood and the wood cannot change its properties. So you can study it. That is what the normative and the positive distinction is about. I cannot tell the wood that, look, you are not a good piece of wood, try to become better. So, but this is, uh, but human beings are not like that. That is why you cannot use the scientific method to study human beings. Now, so we, we go and we study the purpose of lives and we, we find that, look, you have made your purpose, uh, the, uh, that you are trying to get a degree and, and to get a job and to make money, but is this a good way for you to use your life? Can we change the purpose? Yes. And uh, can we learn how we can try to persuade people to change the purpose? This is what the Prophet Sallallahu did. He <coughs> told the people that you are going in the wrong direction. And, and uh, one of the hadiths that the, you are rushing towards the hellfire and I am grabbing you by the neck and trying to protect you from this. So, uh, even if we want to study human beings and societies, we have to ask what is this, uh, what, are the, what is the purpose for which they are living and then we can ask, can we, how can we change this? So, um, in one of my papers I have said that, you know, uh, economics talks about the normative and the positive distinction and we are asking, is Islamic economics a positive science or is it normative? So it's neither. Islamic economics is transformative. It uh, tries to change things. It doesn't say, oh, here is a poor person. Um, this is what hunger looks like. Look, this person is dying of starvation and um, uh, his liver is failing and his heart is failing. No, it says that if he's dying, you intervene. You give him some food. You give him the injection. You give him... So, uh, the neutral detached observation is not part of Islamic ideas. If you see something bad, you try to change it with your hands. So this is not uh, detached neutral observation. So, um, uh, social science depends on purpose and um, even at the <coughs> level of description, before we start to try to change, <coughs> we should try to understand and we can see, we can study purpose. Now, one major, major, major problem with Western epistemology is that they have um, said that we must focus on the observable. So, since purpose is hidden, uh, it becomes uh, secondary less important. So, uh, there are many, um, many, many problems which arise because uh, Western epistemology strongly insists on looking at observable factors and on not looking at unobservables. But the whole world is driven by unobservables. So once you stop looking at unobservables, you can't understand what is happening in the world. So two people, uh, basically behavioral psychology was developed by B.F. Skinner on exactly this assumption that we should look only at the behavior of human beings. We should not look at what is inside the heart. So ultimately this failed and uh, people realized uh, and so basically there is this stimulus response that if you want to study a human being, look at all of the things which came in, all of the stimuli that came into him. So he received his, his mother's love, his affection, he received food, these are the external stimuli and then he responds. So inside him is nothing but the problem is that two people who are identical, you look at the stimulus that is coming in and you look at the behavior that is coming out, 
the identical stimulus and you get different behavior so there must be something inside so uh, if you put uh, one person into one difficulty after another difficulty after another he breaks and he becomes uh, useless but another person he becomes stronger and he becomes more determined and he becomes more powerful so what's the explanation the stimulus is the same it's what's inside him whether he takes this as a as a, uh, in one way depends on whether he takes sabr and or whether he decides that uh, everything is going wrong for me and he says i am useless i am no good i cannot be do anything so he takes this as a sign of his own failure so it depends on how he interprets this stimulus so what's inside the person makes a big difference but behavioral psychology doesn't admit to uh, thinking about inside so more recently in the i guess 70s 80s <coughs> people realize that it this doesn't work and then there is a new field which is called cognitive psychology which says that there are structures of cognition inside the brain but still <coughs> you see what's happening there that you started with a completely wrong theory humans are robots and now after realizing that this has failed people are trying to patch it up same thing is happening in economics that uh people started with the wrong theory of behavior and now uh, uh people find that no people are not like that so they have started this behavioral psychology but this is very very far from the truth and the right approach it, we should not think that uh, just because they have made the correction now they have arrived at the truth they are just uh, starting from a, a a very very dark place they have understood that this doesn't work and they are making some minor corrections it's it's not no nowhere sat near satisfactory the the real uh, place where you need to start from they cannot even approach because we say that the reality of the human being is hidden and unobservable and forever unobservable that it is actually what is inside your heart that determines how you will choose how you will make your choices so this reality it can never be observed and it can change from one minute to the next by uh, a, a radical and one day you decide that okay uh, i have been um, eating too much and i have become fat and now i am going to diet and so suddenly the all the chocolate quick and everything disappears and uh, you are eating one glass of water in the morning <laughs> So why did that happen was well, that something changed in your heart and no matter how much data you collect on the past you will not be able to see this because this is something so but this is the reality this is what is the driver so to think that this unobservable is secondary uh, that means that you are already lost you cannot uh, arrive at the truth <coughs> so the secular answer um to this question well so what really um is amazing is that in the early 20th centuries uh, people recognized that this is a bad thing that the pursuit of wealth is bad but uh, they said let's allow it anyway because this will create this uh, will lead to the accumulation of wealth and once wealth accumulates then we will have we will create heaven on earth because there is no heaven in the afterlife so the only thing we can do is to create heaven on earth and what keynes said explicitly is that <coughs> once wealth accumulates then everything will change because once people have wealth then they will become generous and kind and good the reason that people are selfish and greedy and 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 they behave badly is because they don't have enough money once you have enough money you will relax and you will become happy and you will become generous and you will give it to others because you have enough this is what keynes said so is this true but why not it seems very sensible doesn't it seem very sensible i mean people commit crime people rob because they don't have enough 
If they had enough, then they wouldn't commit any crimes. Right? Why is Keynes wrong? What, what, what happened? I mean, so this prescription that was adopted by the Western society that let greed, let us legitimize greed. We, uh, socially, greed has been considered bad, but now let us change things and let's make greed uh, acceptable and good. Why? Because this will lead to the accumulation of wealth. And once we have wealth, then we will have heavens on earth. So this was the formula that was followed. But it didn't lead to success. Why not? Yes, this is one thing. That uh, greed is insatiable. So if you give a person a mountain of gold, he won't become satisfied and content. And he'll say that, now I have enough money. Now I can share it with others. Now I don't need more. I, I won't need to steal. Instead what happens, that you have one value, you want the other one. So, uh, is it true that the rich people stop trying to, uh, the rich people are less corrupt than the others? <laughs> no, if we look at the Panama Papers, etc., we find <laughs> all of the millionaires are trying to make more money. It is not the poor person who is trying to make more money. So, that's one thing. So, once we realize that the wealthy are not going to share their wealth because they have now become content, then uh, you see that the solution is not going to work. Even if the wealth accumulates, uh, it will go. Where will the wealth go? This is the basic insight of Mars. Suppose that wealth accumulates. Who will get the wealth? Will it go to the poor or will it go to the rich? Why? Yes, the, what Maya says, what, what uh, neoclassical economics says is that the uh, people get according to their marginal product. What Marx says, people get according to their power. So what makes sense? Obviously, people get according to their power. And so, who is going to be the most powerful? The, the, the most wealthy person, not necessarily, but often. <coughs> So actually what we have is the alliance between the military, that's why it's the military industrious, industrialist co complex. The military has power even though they don't have that much wealth. The industry also has, has wealth but they don't have as much power as the military. So they combine. Uh, we have similar phenomena in the Mughal Empire, the Ashrafia and the, um, the military, they were... Um, they were uh, combining the, so they had power and they also utilized this power. So uh, accumulation of wealth is not the problem and is not the solution because trickle down doesn't happen because the poor will not, the rich will not give the money and the poor do not have the power to seize it. So if you look at the past 30 years you find that nearly a, a lion's share of what as the extra wealth is being generated because growth is being pursued and growth is happening. So more money is being produced but it is all going into the hands of the rich and dramatic concentration of wealth has occurred. In 2010, 350 people owned half of the planetary wealth. In uh, 2011, this became 200. In 2012, it became 150. And uh, in uh, 2016, it was about 60 people. And the latest figures are that it's 8 people. So, wealth is rapidly concentrating in the hands of the rich. So, why did it happen since 1980? Why hasn't it been happening since time imm immemorial? This is an important question. From this you can learn some economics. So the pattern of economics changed now. Change. No, for Chicago schools they introduced the fractional reserve system in the past. That caused these kind of things. The austerity, yeah. due to austerity. So it can also, because due to the deregulation of economies and least government interventions, 
But this idea has been going for a long time. But it was pervasive after 1980. So what, what was the change that took place in 1980? I think the change took place before that, uh, the election shock, I think, that was the major. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Yes, that's right. Like market teacher and Reagan, uh, they altered their policies and... Yes, uh, that's right. Reagan and Thatcher uh, came in. Like after 19 yes. But how did Reagan and Thatcher came into power? First of all, you have to understand that classical economics was destroyed in 1929 because classical economists said in... Um, 1928, Fisher and Keynes, they all said that we have achieved prosperity and we will we will now stay on this uh, prosperous priority forever. Same thing happened in 2005 when Robert Lucas, president of American Economics Association, said that now we have solved the problem of depression and we will not see another de depression just before the global financial crisis. So, after the Great Depression, the fallacy and failure of economic theory became clear to all. Keynes started to rethink and he says that, you know, the biggest problem in arriving at this new theory was not that this new theory is difficult to understand, it is the old ideas that I had that are so difficult to get rid of. The brainwashing done by e economic theory is very difficult to overcome as you will find out because you have an assignment <laughs> to have you tried to uh, convince somebody that supply and demand is wrong yes. you will find huh? convince yourself first <laughs> so now uh, your job their assignment for Tuesday is to try to convince somebody and bring me a written transcript of your <coughs> attempt <Sir>. probable failure <laughs> yes <laughs> Yes, that's how, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to say, what are the arguments I use and what was the counter argument? And net result, did they end up being convinced or not? Most likely not. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> so anyway, that's what Cain said, that the most difficult thing. So, one of the results was that the financial uh, institutions, banks were very strictly regulated. In the USA, they said one bank can operate only one state, so it cannot bring, become too large. Uh, there is a maximum interest that it can pay. Uh, banks cannot speculate, they cannot put money into stocks. That was the Glass-Steagall Act. And so many, many regulations were made. But the ultimate regulation, the one that was needed to be done, was not done, was the Chicago Plan and that was to prevent banks from creating money. That was not implemented, even though it was proposed. So, since the 1950s, uh, so uh, very soon, the share of the labor uh, part, the bottom 90% started rising and the share of the top 1% started declining. And uh, very soon mm, the wealthy got together and they made a plan to create a counter-revolution. But they said, and this is basically what Naomi Klein book, The Shock Doctrine, <coughs> explains. They said that, look, we will not be able to create a change uh, until there is a shock and the people are uh, disturbed and confused. So we, we make our plans and we wait for this shock to happen. So they made their plans and they waited patiently and the shock came along in 1970, early 1970s when there was an oil crisis, when the Americans supported the Yom Kippur war. And so the Arab countries cut off embargoed oil, which caused a sudden jump in oil prices in the USA and that led to a recession. So now, 
instead uh, the Chicago school had been waiting for this opportunity and said look this proves that Keynesian economics is wrong so two things happened at the same time the inflation occurred and the unemployment occurred they look Keynes says that these two things cannot happen together you have either aggregate demand uh, is uh, low in which case you will have deflation and unemployment or the aggregate demand is too high which uh, which is means that you have full employment and inflation so you can't have unemployment and inflation according to standard Keynesian theory of course Keynesian theory is talking about demand pull inflation and not cost push inflation and this was actually pointed out but uh, uh, the Chicago school was not uh, interested in truth it was interested in power so they said that look people are unemployed look why are you unemployed it is because of regulations because the free market has been uh, chained by Keynesian theories and so the free market is very powerful if you just let the free market work all of the people will have jobs and they will have unemployment. This, this is the 81 percent, the deception that was <coughs> put before the people that this is your path to prosperity. People were jobless so they were looking for, they were hurting so they were looking for solution so they were offered the wrong solution <coughs> to solve their problems. This is how economic theory works. So. And uh, this had been planned for a long time, the Mount Pelerin Society, I mean, and you, the, all of these things are documented as to how they planned. And, and so, because, and so uh, Reagan and Thatcher came to power because the people had been sold the wrong solution and they thought that Reagan and Thatcher would uh, eliminate the unemployment and give people jobs and, and bring prosperity. So this was the fool's gold or the wrong formula for prosperity that was sold to the people and so they started to break down piece by piece all of the equipment that had been put to bottle the gin of the financial markets and um, even in the path a lot of lot more disasters took place the first thing that Reagan did was to de deregulate the savings and loan industry and <clears throat> that led to immediate disaster. Two or three years later, the deregulated industry caused such a huge loss that 50 years of profits of the banking system were, was wiped out. They did exactly what had been done in the Great Depression. They started speculation on a large scale. Banks have this uh, uh, strange uh, profit function in that they have other people's money and they can use it to speculate. If they speculate and they lose the money, the depositors lose the money. If they speculate and they make 100%, they only have to pay 5% to the depositors and they get 95%. So they have every incentive to gamble and no incentive to not gamble. That's why the regulation was there to prevent them from doing this. So uh, when the savings and loan was deregulated, they started gambling, they invested in Mexican stocks, they collapsed and they lost billions of dollars and the government this time went in and bailed it out and furthermore because this Chicago school was this time very well prepared, they did not let the real cause of the failure uh, get into the uh, perception of the public. So deception upon deception. If you read the Wikipedia entry on the savings and loan collapse, uh, then you see five different reasons listed for why the savings loan collapsed. And I think it may be that I have written the additional, but there is now an additional entry that uh, yes, it could have been due to the deregulation also, <laughs> even though that is the reason. <clears throat> so, uh, otherwise if, if people had said, oh look the first step of deregulation led to disaster, so let's stop this program. No, that didn't happen. Deregulation continued until the last step took place in 1999 and 2000. In 1999 the Glass-Steagall Act, 
which was the one which said that banks cannot speculate, cannot gamble, cannot invest in stocks, that was repealed. And then there was also a Financial uh, Markets Modernization Act in 2000, in which a lot of markets were created which were completely free of regulation. This is what led to the creation of derivatives and other complicated financial instruments which were just designed to fool investors and there was no regulation. So, only seven years later you had this massive financial crisis. But this financial crisis didn't cause any loss to the wealthy. And after that, there was no, <coughs> no regulation. So this time the wealthy were well prepared. This time when the loss occurred to the mortgages and the natural solution was to bail out the mortgages. The, they were the ones who were in distress. Instead of that, the um, Congress passed a bill that let's give trillion dollars to the banks who have deceived the people and, and, and caused this crisis to pr prevent their losses. The banks knew that there was going to be a collapse and they were counting on this bailout. And so that's what happened. It's like you see when you have somebody uh, sticks a knife into the victim and it's bleeding. So you say let's apply the medicine to the knife. <laughs> this is what happened. So uh, there was no help for the bleeding. The mortgages, they, 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 the rates of homelessness and hunger in the USA become the highest they had been since the World War II. And there was no help given to them who had been deceived and defrauded and, and, uh, and made to lose their homes. So this is uh, 81 percent, the theory which uh, and uh, uh, the economists are saying, well, so, uh, sorry, uh, this is how the economic theory works and there is nothing for it to be done. We have the best system. <coughs> So, the point here is that the truth is very powerful, it is completely unknown. See, you come in as students, you come in believing that the truth is well known. Every, I am trying to learn what it is and if I go to Harvard, I will find out the truth. In Harvard, they teach fairy tales. So, the truth is not known and the truth is very powerful. And it has the power to change the world. And it is the same as it was 1400 years ago. <coughs>